Shana Tova. Gemar Chatzima Tova. Welcome to our Kol Nidre service here at Temple Israel. A few things we'd like to mention before we begin our service here this evening. I'd like to point out a few of the safety features of your local Temple Israel sanctuary. You can follow along up on our screens. As always, please know your exits. All exits are indicated by signs in red. They may be next to you, they may be behind you. Fire extinguishers are located in the back of the sanctuary in the mezzanine. The defibrillator is located in the Temple Israel main office. In the case of severe weather, we are, which we are not anticipating this evening, but given that it's Nebraska, you never know. Shelter spots are located downstairs in the main hallway. First aid kits are located in the AV room, the main office, and in the kitchen. We do not anticipate any challenges here this evening, but as always have a plan to run Hydra Fight in the case of emergency. Feel free to call 911. And uh, we do have additional security in and around the building who are dedicated to keeping us safe. If you notice anything, feel free to say something. But we do ask that you make sure your cell phones are turned to silent so as not to interrupt the sanctity of our worship service. And lastly, I'd like to note, in the case of emergency, your mock serim, your prayer books, cannot be used as a flotation device. <laughs> and now it is my pleasure to invite up Justin Cooper, president of Temple Israel, to greet you on behalf of the Board of Trustees. Welcome to Kol Nidre. Good evening to everyone. It's my honor to welcome you on this sacred night. Tonight we begin a time of deep reflection, repentance, and connection. As we prepare to open our hearts and souls, may this service inspire us to seek forgiveness, healing, and renewal. Thank you for being part of the sacred community, and may we all be inscribed for a year of health and peace. Amen. We begin with Avina Malkenu on the slide. Page 112. Avinu Malkenu Ha'er Lanu et Dere Chayenu. Avinu Malkenu, illumine for us the path of our lives. Avinu Malkenu, how shall we find the strength to take the road less traveled by? Avinu Malkenu, how shall we come to know the purpose of our existence? Avinu Malkenu, how shall we learn not to live life in vain? Avinu Malkenu, how shall we get out of our indifference? Avinu Malkenu, how shall we distinguish between truth and falsehood? Avinu Malkenu, how shall we find the answers to our questions? Avinu Malkenu, how shall we gird ourselves with strength to seek the answers? Erev Tov, Shana Tova, dear friends, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to our Temple Israel community for Kol Nidre. Before we begin, I'd like to invite you to take a moment and greet the people next to you. If you see someone that you don't know, take a moment to introduce yourselves.
I invite you to take your seats again as we begin our service. Tonight begins our observance of Yom Kippur, known in our tradition as Shabbat Shabbaton, the Sabbath of Sabbaths. It's a day of reflection and introspection, an opportunity to hold up a mirror to ourselves and to really consider our actions and the way that we encountered the world and the people in our lives during this past year and ask if what we see in that mirror is actually a reflection of our true intentions. Were we really the best versions of ourselves or were, were there times when we missed the mark? I'd be surprised if any person here would be completely at peace with everything this mirror revealed because we're imperfect people and imperfect people make mistakes. These next 24 hours are, op are our opportunity to begin to make amends and strengthen our resolve to change in the coming year, to turn toward the people we want to become, and to turn away from whatever it is that's been holding us back from the act of becoming who we ought to be. On Yom Kippur, this Day of Atonement, many of us take on the mitzvah of fasting from sundown to sundown. For that reason, we often wish, wish each other at Som Kal, an easy fast on this day. But instead of wishing you a day of ease this year, I want to again share with you a teaching from my colleague, Rabbi Adam Greenwald, who challenges us to consider why today is actually intended to be a hard day. I don't wish you an easy Yom Kippur. I wish you a Yom Kippur in which you feel something, even if it's just for 15 minutes or five or one, in which you hear something that challenges you not just to listen, but to do something in which you feel the full ache of Yiskor because you have loved hard in your life and loving never goes away, in which you look inside and see yourself in your life as worthy of doing the hard work of becoming better. I wish you tough, honest, loving conversations with yourself and with each other and with God. I hope the hunger actually makes you more sensitive to the next hungry person you encounter. I hope you hear Isaiah's challenge that fasting doesn't mean a thing unless it's coupled with a commitment to justice. I hope you take care of yourself throughout the day. Take a break when you need to. Close the book when you need to. Eat if your body requires it. Authentically taking care of our needs is also not easy. I hope at some point you dance. I hope at some point you turn to silence. I hope the final shofar blast resonates in your ears for a long while. I don't wish you an easy Yom Kippur, but I do wish you a day that is something so much better than easy, a day of being fully and truly alive. So in these next 24 hours, I do not wish you a day of ease. I don't wish you an easy fast. Instead, I pray that we take these words to heart and let them be our intention for ourselves and for each other on this holy day. I pray that we take this time to pray together, to look at our actions with honesty, and to resolve to change for the better with integrity. I won't say to you som kal, but I will wish you a gamar chatima tova, a prayer that we may finish this year well together. May we all be inscribed in the book of life for another year. Please turn to page nine as we invite Justin Cooper and his family to light our Shabbat and Yom Tov candles.
Okay, the hard part's over. <laughs> the, human the human spirit is the lamp of God, searching out what lies within us. Guided by the flame of conscience, on the sacred night we search for truth. Shine your light upon us as we strive to serve you. May we find safety in your faithful love. We light the flame of healing and forgiveness. On this atonement night, we give thanks for love. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kishanu B'Mitzvotav, Tzimanu L'Hadlik Ner Shel Shabbat Shel Yom HaKiburim. Now we invite David to play for us the haunting melody of Kol Nidre.
We continue now with Nicole Nidre, whose words you can find on page 18. We invite up Sally Kaplan to open the ark, and our Torah holders will be Sarah Cowan, Eileen Arnold, Mindy Marburg, and Jenny Gates Speckman. We invite all those who so choose to rise in body and or in spirit as the ark is opened.
Please join me if you wish. All vows, resolves, and commitments, vows of abstinence and terms of obligation, sworn promises and oaths of dedication that we promise and swear to God and take upon ourselves from this day of atonement until next day of atonement, may it find us well. We regret them and for all of them we repent. Let all of them be discarded and forgiven abolished and undone, 
They are not valid and they are not binding. Our vows shall not be vows. Our resolves shall not be resolves. And our oaths, they shall not be oaths. And we remain standing. Page 22, we turn to the Barahu. Page 25, please be seated. Please join me. Day and night are yours, creator spirit of the universe. The muted colors of twilight, the radiance of dawn. Yours are the spreading wings of light, the deepening shadows of darkness, an ever-changing drama. In the human heart, too, the struggle between darkness and light unfolds. From sunlit heights of generosity, the human heart sinks to the gloomy depths of selfishness. Although we fall, you give us the strength to rise again. You call on those who hurt through word or deed to break free from wrongdoing and return to you. All who hear your call to goodness are embraced. All who reject emptiness and evil find acceptance from you. We come into your presence this night of Kol Nidre, aware that our shortcomings and weaknesses are many. Yet encouraged by your promise of forgiveness, we choose freely the path of repentance, restoring wholeness to our lives and holiness to the world. Baruch Ata Adonai Hama'ariv Aravim. Blessed are you, Adonai, creator of twilight and dusk. Page 28, please rise if it is your custom as we say Shema together. Shema. seated, page 30. We 
continue on page 39 responsively. Our sages taught it is proper to mention the exodus from Egypt in our morning prayers and also at night. We celebrate the going out from Egypt in the morning light, full of confidence and vigor as we enter the new day. But in the evening, weary from day's exertions, cast down and fearful at the coming of the night, what can the exodus teach us then? Our nighttime prayer brings hope and trust in the future, as God did not abandon our people long ago, though the long, dark night of exile, so the Holy One will be with us in the time to come, to stand by the one you love, that is the true essence of faithfulness, the meaning of emunah. So it is written in the Psalms to proclaim your kindness in the morning and your faithfulness in the nights. Sing with joy in the mornings of your life when light surrounds you and the world seems beautiful and good. And in the evenings of your life when you dwell in sorrow and the world seems dark, do not despair. We continue with Micha Mocha on page 40. continue now with the wonderful song of Shabbat with Vishamru on page 44.
Now, I don't know what it is about Kol Nidre, but every time I write a sermon or have most of a sermon written, or in some cases, a full sermon written and edited, I'm never happy with it. And inevitably, I find myself either doing something that I'm not going to do tonight, which is deliver something completely off the cuff, or writing a second sermon. And tonight is the latter as what I wrote to give you a little peek behind the curtain. What I initially wrote was what I thought I wanted to say, but I think tonight is what my heart really wants to speak in conversation with us. There is a tradition in Judaism of keeping two statements written in one's pockets. On one piece of paper, it says, for me, the world was created. On the other, it says, I am but dust and ashes. According to the Talmud, we are supposed to take time to reflect every day on the incredible divine potential implanted within each and every one of us. And that is up to us to bring that divine potential to life. At the same time, we are also to remind ourselves that we are mortal that time is finite. But I think these two papers are more than that. It is also to remind us of how mortality is a gift and not of the preciousness of not only our lives, but also of the lives of those around us as well. And we keep these two statements in our pockets to remind us of how we as Jews are always living in tension. For example, when we pray, we have the keva, the set prayers we recite each time we gather. Tonight, we heard the haunting melody of Kol Nidre. But it is only haunting if we let it touch our souls. This is because prayers are just words, unless we bring kavanah. The intention, the passion, the heart's desires to those words. Our worship service is designed to live within the tension of the fixed versus the intention to help us navigate through the ebbs and flows of the prayer experience. So too it is with our inherited tr interpretive tradition that has been sustaining the Jewish people for 2,000 years since the rise of rabbinic Judaism. There are the fixed rules, halakha, that help guide our observances and our practices. But there is also the intent behind those rules. For example, kashrut at its core is about what we consume. But at its heart, it's not about only what we eat, but being grateful for the food we have and the company to which we enjoy it with. It is about elevating the very act of eating to a holy act. And to focus on one can cause us to lose sight of the other. It is not just about the food, but also the ethics of the food and finding hakarat hatov, the gratitude for having it as well. But I did not come here tonight to merely talk about the tensions of keva and kavana or halakha versus intent. Rather, I wanted to speak about a tension many of us are struggling with. Namely, what does it mean to be Jewish here in the United States? and how that tension is having a greater and greater impact on our lives, and how it is also impacting our community. To start, Jews have been here since the time of Columbus. Though some have speculated that Columbus came from Jewish origins, there is no definitive proof to this claim. However, given his initial voyage took place in 1492, the same year Jews were expelled from Spain, it should come as no surprise that some with him were either Jewish or were very recent conversos who sought to flee Spain. As a recent article states, among the 90 crewmen of Spaniards and Moors were also a few people of Jewish origin. They included two experienced sailors Rodrigo de Triana and Alfonso de la Calle, a physician, Mastre Bernal, a surgeon by the name of Marco, and Queen Isabel's personal inspector, Rodrigo Sanchez de Segovia, perhaps the most high-profile Jew on board, 
who had recently converted to Christianity by force was Luis de Torres, an interpreter for the governor of Murcia. As a result of his knowledge of Hebrew, Arab, Arabic, and Aramaic, and other ancient languages, Columbus thought his linguistic skills would be useful in communicating with the locals. Ever since 1492, Jews have been a part of the Americas. The most of them came here as individuals and did not establish communities. The first known colony was in 1654 when a group of Jews fleeing the Inquisition arrived in New Amsterdam from Recife, Brazil. Despite protests from the colony's director general, Peter Stuyvesant, these refugees were allowed to remain. It probably didn't hurt that some of the largest investors in the Dutch West India Company were Jewish. These 23 refugees were allowed to remain as long as they did not become a burden to the colony. And we have been here ever since. The earliest communities were mostly Sephardic. They established synagogues in places like New York, Savannah, Newport, Charleston, and Philadelphia. But there were always tensions. There were always conditions. There were occasional questions of loyalty, and Jews were often suspect in this fledgling part of the world, often a vestige from Europe. Nonetheless, we found opportunities to thrive and participate in this great American experiment. For example, we have fought in every knit war this nation has faced. We fought on both sides of the Revolutionary War. We fought each other in the Civil War. And yes, there were Jewish slave owners. But, and I must emphasize this point, Jews did not create, nor were we responsible for the slave trade. Sadly, a libelous claim that persists to this very day. To demonstrate how we have been accepted here, we often refer to George Washington's letter to the Hebrew congregation in Newport, which he wrote in 1790, 1791, stating in part, it is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it were the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed at the ex exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the government of the United States, which, which gives bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. He goes on, may the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree and there shall be none to make him afraid. This letter is all the more remarkable, especially if you think about how we were treated throughout the history of our time in Europe. But despite all of our successes, despite all of our integration into American society, we have always been in tension between being fully Jewish and fully American. The largest group of Jews, including most of us, can trace our ancestry to our parents, our grandparents, or our great-grandparents fleeing Europe between the 1880s and the 1920s. They fled persecution, they fled pogroms, they fled for a better life. Sadly, we know what happened to those who remained. But this nation, which prides itself on welcoming immigrants with open arms, was very nervous about the so-called unwashed, uneducated masses, and facing an onslaught of undesirables, closed its doors with the Immigration Act of 1924. Yes, the law was mostly targeting Jews. In many cities, there were red lines where Jews could live. Baltimore, where I served as a rabbi for six years, is still grappling with its anti-Jewish and anti-black housing laws. There were quotas in colleges and professions. This is in part why we created Hollywood and the comic book, the musical comedy, and were heavily involved in the development with jazz, not because we were such a creative people, but because those were the opportunities afforded to us. 
We created our own country clubs and built our own hospitals to train our own doctors. And we even established some of our own universities to educate our young. Nonetheless, there was an expectation both amongst ourselves and by the larger community that ultimately we would assimilate into American culture. There is a saying that the largest collection of tefillin can be found in the East River. As Jews cast aside the trappings of Judaism as soon as they arrived on these shores. And we've been told over and over again to be Jewish in the synagogue, but not to be too Jewish when it comes to the outside world. We can even see it today in shows like Seinfeld. Clearly, all the main characters, except perhaps Kramer, are clearly Jewish. George, in particular, was a stereotypical New York Jew, but in an effort to make the show have a broader appeal, they made him Italian. According to historian Jeffrey Chandler, the masking of Jews on television has created crypto-Jews, characters who while nominally identified as having some other ethnicity or religion, are nonetheless regarded by some viewers and even some creators as Jews in disguise. In Chandler's view, such crypto-Jews are a sign of the ethnic relativism that marks much of contemporary American culture. Be Jewish, but not too Jewish. Despite this tension, we managed to become the most successful diaspora community in history. For many, the United States became our new Zion, our new Zion. It was common in many Reformed congregations to hear rabbis preach against immigration to British Palestine because we did not need a return of the state of Israel as we have our new home. But for some, this message was too much as they had dreams of building and returning to Israel. This tension actually split a handful of congregations across the country, including most famously Beth Israel in Houston, which saw a break off of 200 families to form Temple Emmanuel. As Rabbi David Lyon wrote about his community, it was a tension, a rift, that tore apart not only a community, but also families that took decades to heal. And yes, we feel a similar tension in our own community today. A tension we are struggling with over how it means to continue to be in relationship, even if it feels like the world is trying to tear us apart. And this is the tension we live in today, which has come to the forefront even more so since the events of October 7th. And that is in part because we as Jews have always been suspect throughout our wanderings. I was reminded of this as I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts recently, Torah Smash. They argued the world seems to want to always want to have a supervillain, a role Jews have been cast into for generations. As Dr. Deborah Lipsat has so eloquently stated, Anti-Semitism is the world's oldest conspiracy theory. If you need us to be guilty of deicide, so be it, we killed God. We killed children to use our blood to make matzah. Never mind that murder is a violation of the Ten Commandments and halakha prohibits the consumption of blood. We are communists. We are globalists. We control the media. We control the weather. Yes, we created a hurricane right before Yom Kippur, hitting Florida, where a large portion of Jews live. We control world events. We are all powerful, yet we are also lazy and incompetent. We are white genocidal colonists, and yet we are non-white disruptors and threats to the establishment. There is no consistency. We are merely cast as a villain over and over again for whatever role the world and the hate mongers need us to be. But this is not about anti-Semitism. This is about us. The problem is 
we have started to let some of these hate-filled stereotypes and accusations enter into our own conversations with and about each other. To be in tension means we cannot, we must not let others define who we are even as we live in the tension of what it means to be Jewish, to be American, to be human, and to be in community. To live in this tension also means being Jewish is all joy and no fun. We have competing desires, competing values, competing hopes, competing dreams, and competing fears. Some of us want to live fully in our new Zion, our home here in America. Others embrace the tikvah, the hope that Israel represents for us now and for the future. Some of us live in between the two, and some of us are just trying to make it from one day to the next. But what we cannot do, we cannot let these tensions tear us apart or to tear apart our community. And we cannot let them diminish our ability to live meaningful, full Jewish lives no matter where we find ourselves. This is because the world we live in continually tells us over and over again, our place as Jews, where we belong and where we don't belong. And I'll be honest, I've had enough of it. Being Jewish does not mean you have to narrowly define things for yourself. When it is done right, it is done about creativity. It is, done, it is about exploration, it is about questioning, and most importantly, it is about curiosity. We get to define it for ourselves, and we should never cede that power to anyone else. We are already living with enough pain and enough hurt to keep handing that power over to others. So where do we go from here? In the words of Rachel Goldberg Poland, mother of the murdered hostage Hirsch Goldberg Poland, was asked in an interview about how she can possibly move forward after her son was killed, she replied, there are people who walked out of Auschwitz and went on to have a good life. They never forgot their parents and their siblings and their spouses and their children who they lost there. But they went out and they decided and it took tremendous effort, and they had good lives. And there are people who walked out of Auschwitz and never left Auschwitz, she added. We're in mourning, we're suffering, but we're making a choice personally that we are going to live life. We need to do it for ourselves, we need to do it for our daughters, and we need to do it because Hirsch would want us. So we will live life. As we gather this evening asking to be sealed into the book of life, invoking of the, the words of Kol Nidre, all vows, we stood as one community asking to be forgiven for the sins that we will commit this coming year, not for the sins we committed this past year. It is a curious notion, which is why many Jewish theologians and communal leaders have struggled with Kol Nidre over the generations but the more I reflect on it, the more I embrace it because it reminds us of how we are in tension with the past, with the present, and with the future. It is up to each of us, each of us, to find the best path forward. I do not stand here today to tell you the correct path because each of us must find our own way. What I am here to tell you is that Temple Israel, your Temple Israel, can be a home base for your Jewish journeys. Cantor Alexander, Rabbi Berton, and I are but caretakers in your over 150-year-old congregational family and community. There were those who came before us, and God willing, there will be those who follow us. Some were giants, and some were but wayfarers in this long, illustrious history. But we are ready to stand beside you as you, as we, grapple with all of these tensions. We are all feeling the strain. We are all feeling the discomfort. We are all feeling a little lost and a little lonely. We are all grieving over through the tremendous losses of life and we are struggling with what it means to live authentic Jewish lives that embody our core values. 
Let's be honest, living authentic, meaningful Jewish lives is hard. To be Jewish means living in two worlds, the worlds between tradition and modernity, to live between keva and kavanah, to live between observance and authenticity, to live between being American and being Jewish, to live between at least two understandings of Zion, and to live in the tension between joy and sorrow. Recognizing all of this, to borrow from Rachel Goldberg Poland, now is the time to keep living. L'chaim, to life. This does not mean we abandon the hurts of the past or ignore the pains of the present. It means we continue to pray for an end to the violence and a return of the remaining 100 plus hostages, including seven Americans. It does not mean we inure ourselves against the tragedies that continue to befall our world. Even as we celebrate our joys, we will continue to find pathways to comfort each other in our sorrows. Even as we celebrate our heritage, we will continue to shout out about our frustrations, our hurts, and our disappointments with and through our complicated tradition. But there is also a greater need as well. To this end, we need to keep searching for, exploring, and ultimately embracing the pathways that keep leading meaningful, authentic Jewish lives, no matter where we find ourselves on this journey. For it is by navigating all of these tensions, we may very well find the pathway home. For as our pockets remind us, for me, the world was created, and I am but dust and ashes. Shana Tova. Let our prayers rise. All souls will praise you. Guard our homes and grant us peace. Give us blessing in all that we do. To which we say, Amen.
71. We read responsively at the second reading. On this night of atonement, grant us, God, a sense of your presence as we call upon your name. Speak your hopeful message to each yearning heart and answer the worthy petitions of each searching soul. Purify and strengthen our noble strivings and cleanse us of our, un our unworthy desires. Join us together in fellowship and in love and grant us the joy which comes from enriching other lives. Help us to be loyal to the heritage we share. Draw us near to Torah in wisdom and in faith. Strengthen our devotion to our people everywhere. Keep alive our faith in righteousness and truth. Bless us with hopes to uplift our daily lives and keep steadfast our courage and our resolve at all times. On this night of atonement, help us, God, to be worthy of your presence as we call upon your name. Turn to page 82 as we begin this section of the Dewey, our confessions, the ways that we have made mistakes and missed the mark in the past year. We'll repeat after Cantor as she sings the words and we'll invite you, if it is your custom, to tap your heart, showing an outward ritual of the pain that we feel and an effort to make amends. Please rise. Join me of these wrongs we are guilty. We betray, we steal, we scorn. We act perversely. We are cruel, we scheme, we are violent, we slander, we devise evil, we lie, we ridicule, we disobey, we abuse, we defy, we corrupt, we commit crimes, we are hostile, we are stubborn, we are immoral, we kill, we spoil, we go astray. We lead, we lead others, others astray. astray. You may be seated. We continue on page 86. 
Alchet shechatanu lefanecha v'zadonu v'ishkaga, v'alchet shechatanu lefanecha b'dibor peh. The ways we have wronged you deliberately and by mistake, and harm we have caused in your world through the words of our mouths. Alchet shechatanu lefanecha b'imut halev, v'alchet shechatanu lefanecha b'tifshut peh. The ways we have wronged you by hardening our hearts, and harm we have caused in your world through careless speech. The ways we have wronged you through lies and deceit, and harm we have caused in your world through gossip and rumor. The ways we have wronged you by judging others unfairly, and harm we have caused in your world through disrespect to parents and teachers. The ways we have wronged you through insincere apologies and harm we have caused in your world by mistreating a friend or a neighbor. The ways we have wronged you through violence and abuse and harm we have caused in your world through dishonesty and business. For all, all these failures of judgment and will, God of forgiveness, forgiveness, pardon us, us forgive us, pardon, pardon us, us, lead us to atonement. atonement. The ways we have wronged you openly and secretly, and harm we have caused in your world by losing self control. The ways we have wronged you through sexual immorality and harm we have caused in your world through consumption of food and drink. The ways we have wronged you by giving in to our hostile impulses and harm we have caused in your world through greed and exploitation. The ways we have wronged you through cynicism and scorn and harm we have caused in your world through arrogant behavior. Page 90. The ways we have wronged you by hating without cause and harm we have caused in your world through offensive speech. The ways we have wronged you with a slanderous tongue and harm we have caused in your world through a selfish or petty spirit. For all these failures of judgment and will, God of forgiveness, forgive us, pardon us, lead us to atonement.
We continue on page 93, responsibly, for acts of healing and repair. God, our creator and guide, let us speak now of the healing acts by which we bring you into the world, the acts of repair that make you a living presence in our lives. For the, for the act of healing we have done openly, done openly or anonymously, and for the, the act of repair we have done without personal gain. For the act of healing we have done by seeking forgiveness, and for the act of repair we have done by forgiving others. For the act of healing we have done through righteous giving, and for the act of repair we have done by opening our hearts. For the act of healing we have done by comforting the mourner and visiting the sick, and for the act of repair we have done by pursuing justice and human rights, fairness, and civility. For the act of healing we have done by making peace between one person and another, and for the act of repair we have done by protecting nature and all its creatures. For the act of healing we have done by teaching our children the ways of peace, and for the act of repair we have done by teaching our children the ways of Torah. For the act of healing we have done by honoring elders and loving the stranger, and for the act of repair we have done in response to your commandment, choose life and blessing. But all kulam and all these bring nearer the day when you shall be one and your name shall be one. We continue back on page 72 with Ritzay. Please join me in a prayer for the descendants of Abraham. In times of war and terror, it is the innocent who suffer the most. As the saying goes, war is not hell, because in hell there are no innocents. 
Ribono Shalom, God, we pray for all those who are suffering. May the leaders of the myriad of communities recognize the humanity, not just of the other, but also of their own. We pray for a speedy resolution to this conflict. May all the descendants of Abraham, the children of Isaac and Ishmael, come to see the humanity in each other. For on that day, peace can dwell upon the land and her inhabitants. Until that day, we pray for all who are suffering, and we ask you, God, to bring comfort to them and all those who are bereaved. Amen. Amen. We invite you to take a few moments of silent prayer, either with the words on the page through page 81 or the prayers that are in your heart. Pleasure to invite the president of our board of trustees, Justin Cooper, to address our congregation.
Ulashana Tova Tikatevu, a phrase we should all be familiar with by now. It's a phrase I've been spending a lot of time thinking about as we continue to celebrate the high holidays and as we arrive at Yom Kippur. You might know it to mean, may you be inscribed in the Book of Life. I took this phrase quite literally as a child and hoped that I wouldn't die in the horrific methods described in the Tanakh Tokev by fire, by water, by beasts, by stoning. This is pretty frightening stuff for a child and maybe even as an adult. But as I grew older, the concept of free will and the acknowledgement of human frailty softened the story for me. It allowed me some uh, efforts at misdeeds to be forgiven and hopefully not repeated. Like all things, time passes, high holidays come and go, and hopefully as humans, we evolve, our language evolves with us, how we interpret words and, and blessings change. The interpretation and meaning of changes of these prayers because of our experience, our understanding, and our constant need to understand and have clarification in relevancy of these ancient words. Before we started using this Maxor, Gary Kaplan, a blessed memory, went to the rabbinic assembly and he brought back this updated translation. May you be inscribed for a life well lived. It's this translation, may you be inscribed for a life well lived that I wish to talk to you a little bit tonight about and how as active membership in Temple Israel may help you, guide you on that path. To gain a deeper understanding, I sought out articles and quotes and books, anything that would give me some insight into what it meant to live a life well lived. My primary takeaway from the research was reflected in Rabbi Kushner's book, To Life, A Celebration of Being and Thinking. And he writes, in part, Judaism is less about believing and more about belonging. It's less about what we owe God and more about what we owe each other. Because he believes God cares more about how we treat one another than about theology. And so if a life well lived is about relationship and belonging, what is it exactly that we owe each other? Ralph Waldo Emerson answers the question and he says, to know even one life, breathe easier because you have lived. That is a successful life. That is a life well lived. So breathing, that should be easy enough. I almost do it automatically. Uh, in the next year, how do we make it easier for each other to breathe a little easier with a little less anxiousness, a little less fearfulness? I think one of the many attributes of being together at Temple Israel is empathy and compassion for one another. We need to be there for each other in these times of stress and angst. Let's also be there for one another, not just to listen but to, and not respond, but to listen and to understand each other. So how do we do this? Maybe it's as simple as Rabbi Behrens that makes it seem. She frequently talks on Friday night services about taking a moment to breathe deeply, to center oneself, and then provide the opportunity for others to take a deep breath and become centered. A deep cleansing breath amongst friends that softens the harshness of the outside world for just a few minutes. A breath that includes a helpful hand, a kind word, an empathetic collective sigh, and maybe even a big Rabbi Azrael hug. A breath that tells you your friends that they are not alone. We have the capacity to share and tell our friends that they matter. Let's make a pledge today to spend more time with each other, both inside and outside of these walls. Let's call someone on the Mishabara list and tell them we are here for them and willing to listen. Let's do coffee with friends who have become empty nesters, lost a loved one, or going through difficult financial times, or just to re-engage with someone we haven't seen for a while. We have the capacity 
to provide warmth in our relationship with one another and to tell each other that we matter. And let's acknowledge that breathing since October 7th of last year has been a lot harder. Synagogues are complex and exceedingly diverse. A healthy synagogue culture embraces and nourishes its leaders and congregants who are self-reflective, transparent, and open to feedback. It encourages a diversity of opinion for new ideas amongst its congregants and their clergy, providing key components for moving together as a sacred community. There's no one recipe for this. There are, however, uh, specific ingredients present when a synagogue is robust. The literature says in the post-pandemic world of the 21st century, we need to be vitality, prosperity, and sustainability. So vitality, we want the community at Temple of Israel to be strong and active. We want to see a dynamic congregation, an environment that is vibrant, that is more than just existing. We want everyone who walks into this building to feel energized, spirited, and welcome. So does Temple have vitality? A quick look at the calendar and the programming would tell you that we do. Beyond celebrating the traditional holidays to get more people in the door, there is a smorgasbord of social events and religious, religious events to attend to. There's a group for our toddlers and their parents, our thriving group of 20-somethings, a strong and dedicated Torah study group, a racial justice group, and the revitalization of our school. We've got Rosh Hodesh group, our Holy Smokes, we've got the sixth grade retreat, and this spring, our civil rights trip to the South. We hope that you can breathe easier knowing that we have something for everyone in this building. Prosperity, is the synagogue thriving? Is it alive with purpose, activity, and energy? Is it flourishing? Does our congregation and our synagogue continue to blossom and grow? Our staff is now complete and comprised of some new faces. And as we settle in with the new staff comes a plethora of new ideas and engaging ideas that become refreshing programs and bring some newcomers into the building. While we are generally maintaining our official membership, we have not been there for all of our members. We have not reached out to our members and former members to reinvigorate them and excite them about what brought them into Temple initially. We have failed to see members who have left us and have become less involved, failed to see the signs of their discontent, their isolation, or their feeling of alone and apart. We have failed simply to ask them to join us. We can do better in keeping our friends close and intimate. We hope that you can breathe easier knowing that there's someone in this building here for you. And then there's the sustainability. Is the work here we are doing maintainable? Are the methods we are employing malleable and supportive to the continued life of Temple Israel? It can be, but needs some work. I have to admit that I never truly understood the idea of asking for money on the holiest day of the year. It seems misplaced and, in a sense, wrong to me. We are here to pray. We are here to reflect. We are here to atone. But then it dawned on me, Jews don't generally pray alone. We don't atone for by ourselves. Rather, we come together generation to generation. We stand in unison. We sit in unison. And yet on this day, in this synagogue, and in this city, our community is more important than ever. Praying together is important. Coming together is important. And so too is the collective support of what we strive to accomplish. As we reflect on the power of community, we recognize that maintaining this sacred space where we pray, we learn, and grow together requires the collective effort of all who call it home. Just as we rely on one another for spiritual and emotional strength, our synagogue relies on the generosity of its members to sustain its programs, its services, and its future. Today, I invite you to consider 
a contribution, no matter how small or large, to help ensure that the doors continue to be open for the, all who seek comfort, connection, and faith within these walls. Your support strengthened us all. The reality is that our traditional new dues models only covers about half of our expenses. We have gracious benefactors that have given us endowments that have allowed us to stay financially afloat for the past few years. And I simply ask you to look out and check out our new circle of giving that supplements your annual dues. Vitality, prosperity, quality clergy and staff do not come without a financial commitment. I hope you can breathe a little easier knowing that the needs of the synagogue have been met. So as we continue to, to come together to work on part of a synagogue and a congregation that has vitality, prosperity, and sustainability, let us come together and act as we act as we truly owe one another, and that is to be present for one another and to be kind to one another. I hope that being together we can make life easier for each other so that we can all breathe a little easier and be on our way to be inscribed for a life well lived. Shana Tova Tikadebu. We continue now with our service of memory. And given that I am still in the period, like some of you in Shloshim, I have asked for my dear colleagues to support me during this time to lead us during these prayers. I invite you to rise if I say the name of a loved one, somebody that you're remembering whose memory may be especially poignant in these times where we remember the people who gathered around our tables, who sat in the seats next to us. As a community, we remember those that will be laid to rest this week, Mimi Rogers Farkas and Nathan Patrick Nutt. We are in Shiva the first seven days of mourning for Judith Kaplan. We are in Shloshim the first 30 days of mourning for Harlan Rips, Alan Podash, Linda Scharf, Jerome Kaiman, Scott Thompson. We recall the art sites of Robert L. Baker, Ray Leah Brodke, Justice Donald Brodke, Barbara Lieberman Froman, Ida D. Gitlin, Ruth Fox Gorham, Lillian Alice Lipsy Greenberg, Addie Gross, Eric Brandon Harrison, Jacob Hart, Emma Jarecki Hart, Rosa Hiller, Eva Kirschbron, Sydney David Leo, Robert Levine, Sidoni Marburg, Louise Rothkop Mayer, Orville Alex Milder, Raquel Newman, Doris Jean Oglander, Janet S. Perlmeter, Mary Kaiser Rabiner, Felicia Schreier, Hi S. Schreier, Shirley Smirin, Sharon Sobel, Edwin N. Summer, Audrey Sofer, Walter Zev Stark, Edith Stein, Mrs. Tony Stern, Robert M. Stifler, and Ken Wiseman. We rise together as one community, remembering these names and the names that we hold in our hearts, and say the Mourners' Cottage together on page 122. Yikadal vi kadash meraba, be alma di brach irute vi amlich malhute, Bahaye hon uvi omehon, Uvahaye de hobe Israel, Bagala uvis man kariv vi imru amen. Yehesh me raba mivorach leolam ula me amaya, Yiparach vi ishtabach vi paar vi turamam vi et nasse, Vi tadar vi talav vi talal shme de kudisha, rihu. La ela ula ela mi ko birchata vishirata, Tushbachata venechamata, De amiran be alma vi imru, amen. Yehe shlama rabba min shemaya, Vahayim alenu ve al ko yisrael, 
imru amen. O se shalom bimro mav, hu ya se shalom, alenu ve al kol yisrael, ve al kol yoshvetevel, ve imru amen. Zichronam li raha, may their memories always be for a blessing. We say together, amen. amen. Please be seated. I'd like to invite Justin back up to the microphone to share some announcements for the rest of the day as we celebrate Yom Kippur and things to come. Well, I'm not sure what sin I committed that I have to do a speech and the announcements, but uh, here we go. Uh, I'd like to thank the clergy, Rabbi Scharf, Rabbi Berzin, and Cantor Alexander, our musicians, Jennifer, David, and Darcy, Jerry, our choir director in the Colerini Choir, at the back of the house, uh, Scott and Phyllis and Ed. Hospitality, David. Uh, tech is Eli, Nate, and Tim. Security is Elite Tactical. Uh, the congregation and the support of the members and donors, we also would like all the board members to stand up and wave and acknowledge your presence. Thank you. Thank you to all the volunteers tonight who are our Torah holders, we appreciate your previous leadership and continued dedication to Temple Israel. We hope to see you back here tomorrow for Yom Kippur. The morning begins with our tat service at 9.30, with morning services starting at 10.30. In the afternoon, we have asked Rabbi Sharf in the chapel, followed by a service of healing, Yisgar and Nila back in the sanctuary before we come together for break the fast for those who remember to RSVP. Uh, if you've missed your RSV, please, please see Allison, and we can see if there's some space for you. In between the morning and afternoon, we'll do some sorting and packing of our annual food drive in the social hall. So come in uh, and, and bring in your donations of food that are going to go to the food uh, bank of the Heartland. We are hoping this year to gain, have 4,000 pounds of food. Our social justice committee is asking you to join the fight as they partner with Project Our Rights in order to protect access to reproductive rights in Nebraska. Join us on Wednesday, October 16th for a phone bank event. Please register with us so we know that you're coming. Sukkot begins next week. We invite you to use our sukkah and attend any of our events that we have planned in the sukkah. The service is on October 17th. We have classic Shabbat with an oneg in the sukkah on uh, Friday, October 18th. Shushi in the sukkah with our 20-somethings. Please register on October 19th. And lunch with the clergy and happy hour in the sukkah on October 22nd. Then on October 23rd, we will have our community Simchat Torah celebration. Guess what? RSVPs. Cost is only $5. Tat Shabbat is next week. Register and let our TOT team know that you're coming. Our next installation of Rosh Hodesh is November 3rd, when we will meet at uh, the Birthing Center, funded by I Black Girl, a nonprofit located in North Omaha. Register to attend. The last call for an adult civil rights trip with Sadaka, Sadiq America, that's taking place in April 2025. Please register if you're still on the fence. If you have questions, reach out to Rabbi Berenson. Finally, Temple Israel has become a co-sponsor for every voice, every vote. This nonpartisan effort is asks our community to come together for a virtual series where we'll take action and learn from trusted nonpartisan organizations. The next event is on October 15th. The event begins with training and text voters in Ohio to support fair voting district. Some other important dates that are on the website, November 15th is consecration, December 6 to 8 will be our residence weekend with Rabbi Rachel Berkowitz, and December 15th, Hanukkah celebration. I think that's it. Ooh, thank you. Thank you, Justin. And we'd also like to note, as we are coming to the conclusion of our Kol Nidre service, many of you are planning on fasting. Fasting is a way of expressing our spiritual selves to connect us with our bodies, with our souls. It is supposed to be difficult. It is supposed to challenge us. It is not supposed to put our health at risk. So if you need to eat or drink, if you take medication that requires it, if you have 
uh, food challenges that require you to eat, please do not withhold that from yourself. For the goal is to come out of this spiritually and physically whole as much as we can in these times and not to destroy ourselves in this pursuit of finding new pathways towards holiness and teshuva. We continue now with our concluding melody of Hashi Venu, which you can find up on our screens. invite you to rise for a concluding benediction. Rabbi Levi Yitzhak of Berdichev used to be very calm whenever Yom Kippur fell on Shabbat. When asked why, he explained, we all know that riding is forbidden on Shabbat, except in cases of Pekuach Nefesh. This means that God won't be able to write our names in the book of death today, but only the book of life. 
Today is the most hopeful day I can imagine. Each of us, every single one of us, deserves to be written in the book of life. May this day and this year bring us some sense of certainty that the Holy One of Blessing is only writing our name for good. May we all be written and sealed in the book of life and in the book of peace. Shana Tovah.